Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are as you join us. My name is Timothy Cheek, and I am the director of the Center of Chinese Research in the Institute of Asian Research and the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs here at UBC in Vancouver. I am pleased to welcome you to this first session of our 2021-22 CCR Symposium, Seeing Like an Empire, Chinese Political Thought in Changing Times. First, I would like to acknowledge that those of us at UBC's Vancouver campus are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We are honored to live and work here. This symposium will cover a wide range of periods and topics from the imperial period to Xi Jinping. We will be looking at Chinese political thought through the lens of new sinology by taking thought and experience from the last two millennia seriously in its own right and putting it into conversation with 20th century political thought and practice in China. For those who wonder what the contemporary or policy relevance of traditional Chinese history might be, I refer you to the historical resolution of the sixth plenum of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party and the pronouncements of General Secretary Xi Jinping. You're all up on that, right? I mean, it's already been out for 24 hours. Well, in any event, perhaps one of my points of a few points of agreement with the General Secretary is on the importance of studying history for today. Our first guest for this symposium will be Dr. Timothy Brook, Republic of China Chair in the UBC's Department of History and Institute of Asian Research. Our senior China historian at UBC and probably the most well-known Canadian sinologist worldwide, Dr. Brook hardly needs an introduction. He has been a force in bringing the early modern world into conversation, uh, connecting East and West in seminal studies such as Vermeer's Hat. He has also served as the president of the Association for Asian Studies, and he continues to bring colleagues together. Uh, he is the author of numerous books, most recently Sacred Mandates, Asian International Relations since Genghis Khan in 2018, Great State, China and the World, 2020, and Completing the Map of the World, Cartographic Interaction and Between China and Europe, published uh, in, in a bilingual edition, Chinese and English, in 2020. Dr. Brooks' lecture today is entitled The Unity of the People from Ming Statecraft to Republican Revolution to Party Dictatorship. In a manner that will be familiar to readers of his many books, particularly from Vermeer's Hat onward, Dr. Brook takes a comparative approach in this lecture, reviewing the writings of statecraft scholar Qiu Jun in the Ming Dynasty in comparison with those of Sun Yat-sen and Hu Shi in the early 20th century. I consider this new, a new sinology approach, and I assure you that by the end of this talk, you will be thinking of the political use of unity in contemporary China in new and useful ways. We are joined by Dr. Lei Jenko, uh, Professor of Political Theory in the Department of Government at uh, London School of Economics. As part of our symposium, she offers a considered commentary, not the usual brief discussions comments. One may reasonably ask why invite a political scientist to comment on something grounded in 15th century Chinese history? Well, anyone who has read one of her books will know why, from her study of the May 4th political theory in Making the Political in 2010, to changing reference in 2015 on Chinese and Western political theory, to the collection Chinese Thought as Global Theory in 2016 and many other writings. In fact, she is currently working on the relationship between late Ming Neo-Confucian ideas, particularly of the Taizhou School of Wang Yangming, of Yangming learning, and also looking at how Chinese and Dutch writers grounded distinctive justifications for colonial rule on the island of Taiwan in the 17th and 18th century. So today we have kindred spirits. Let us begin with Timothy Brook. 
Thank you, Tim. Um, I will, uh, by way of introduction, will just say that uh, this lecture is, um, well, I'm, first of all, I'm going to thank um, Tim Cheek for uh, putting me up to this. I've been working on the subject of statecraft now for well over a decade with a group of some 20 scholars and students worldwide. I should particularly thank uh, Dalian Bin, my former graduate student, who is also my collaborator on this project. Um, but it was Tim who prompted me to start <clears throat> talking about what I found, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Ming statecraft tradition. I gave a lecture uh, two and a half weeks ago for Cornell University in which I uh, first laid out some of my thoughts on this subject. This is the second lecture, and I'm thinking of this as a series that's going to go on as I keep drawing different aspects of Ming statecraft forward uh, and put them in conversation with the 21st century. Um, that said, I'm going to today's lecture is going to repeat roughly half of what I said in my Cornell lecture. Um, and so just please bear with me if you happen to have attended that lecture. The second half is going to go is going to go in the direction of dealing with an issue that actually was stimulated by uh, Tim Cheek's most recent essay, Xi Jinping's Counter Reformation, in which he talks about the importance of unity. And as soon as that came up in his paper, I realized, well, that is a Ming topic. And so the second half of my paper is going to is going to be dealing with the question of unity. So this is old school. I have no PowerPoint. I'm not going to show you anything. I'm just going to read a rather long lecture. It's going to take me about an hour. Bear with me, if you will. Under six headings, <clears throat> politics is history, Republican dilemmas, Chiu Jin, <clears throat> the people as political subjects, <clears throat> reason of state, and finally, unity. <clears throat> so I will begin. Politics is history. China is one of the most governmentalized countries in the world, a country in which the state has the capacity to order almost all aspects of life and in which society has effectively no mechanisms to challenge, reprove, or alter the state. The penetration of state administration into everyday life is not as thorough as some unsympathetic observers suggest, yet the views that the government is authorized Yet the view that the government is authorized to monitor any aspect of individual or social life, even life itself, is widely understood and accepted by most Chinese as a feature of what they imagine to be the proper function of the state. In vivid contrast to what most North Americans imagine to be legitimate state functioning. China is not unique as a culture where people acquiesce in raison d'etat the belief that the protection of state interests is the first condition of state viability, or where the state recognizes no real constitutional limits on its exercise of sovereignty. But China is somewhat in its own category as a political culture in which the absence of constitutional limits and the accessibility of society to state direction are openly declared, even celebrated as model features of good government not just provisionally during a tutelary period, but confidently as permanent features, as evidence, in fact, that the People's Republic of China has brought history to an end. Reaching the end of history was, of course, the Hegelian claim that some American commentators made after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that the liberal democratic order had shown itself to be the natural endpoint of a transformation begun in the Renaissance with the decline of monarchy. American politics of the past decade have proven this to be a fragile claim. Do Chinese politics tell the opposite story? That is to say, has that experiment in state organization, by contrast, reached a stage at which it has so thoroughly resolved its internal contradictions that the system has been perfected, alternate paths into the future closed off, and history brought to an end? Much in the past decade, indeed in just the last few years, suggests that this could be so. The Chinese Communist Party's experiment has brought China to so perfected a condition that it gives the PRC state a free hand to see, seize Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor as hostages and place them in solitary detention for almost two years in defiance of international law. It authorizes the PRC state to arrest and shame such critics as dismissed Tsinghua University law professor Xu Zhangrun. 
It gives the PRC state the authority to imprison Uyghur intellectuals, as well as to incarcerate over a million Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims, purely because of their ethnic identity. To mention but a few of the many recent events that do not stand up to international legal scrutiny. And I will note without much negative comment from Chinese people. These developments have led me to ask by what standards state action is lawful when that state is the People's Republic of China. Now, these opening comments should by now have some of you squirming in your seats at what sounds like Temur Ruscola's charge of legal orientalism. I have long admired Ruscola's critique of the pervasive narrative in the study of comparative law, polarizing a legal, a lawful West with an unlawful East. But I find myself having to reflect upon acts of the PRC state that offend my sense of lawfulness. Ruscola is fond of citing Clifford Geertz's observation that law, quote, is part of a distinctive manner of imagining the real, or in Timu's own terms, a structure of the political imagination. I recognize that law is not natural, but imagined, constructed, particularly law in its liberal form. In Ruscola's terms as, quote, a fundamental element in the modern worldview that conceives of the individual as the paradigmatic existential political and legal subject and the state as the privileged medium for the instantiation of its universal values. As a historian, however, I cannot help but notice that law is constructed in relation to intentional histories through which people have striven to produce a system of order in which the claims of an individual that an individual may make to warrant his acts as lawful are not in every case outweighed by the claims a state may make against them. If the observation that law is a structure of the political imagination somewhat alarms me, it is because it leaves people vulnerable to act by political agents with different imaginations, whether they are the poppycocks at the pinnacle of state power or low life running errands for the local police. To aver that law has no fixed content sounds intellectually rigorous. But in all legal systems, law has content, and that content affects profoundly what people are allowed or expected or required to do as the legal subjects that the particular system of law they live under constructs them as being. Law is a construction, but it in turn constructs us. And in ways that given its service to the state, render resistance difficult. The story that law ends up telling may not be the story we want told. And saying so need not to reduce us to either legal, to being legal orientalists or polite cultural relativists. When legal systems differ as the PRC legal system does, the differences can be subjected to analysis that is not purely prejudicial. As Donald Clark has written, uh, so uh, recently and so persuasively, quote, in the case of China, at least, there is prima facie evidence suggesting that we should at least be open to the idea that the Chinese order system is fundamentally different from what we think of as a legal system. And it should not be methodologically impossible, let alone politically incorrect, to say so. <laughs> I am not a philosopher of law, but a historian. And so today I will use what is in my toolkit <clears throat> and to apply the history of state formation and political philosophy to the current wave of totalitarianism and see what turns up. Taking a historical approach requires suspending any notion that the PRC state is the necessary, let alone end of history outcome of a Chinese tradition. It is simply a temporary outcome of a complex set of factors and conjunctures shaped by policies, protocols, and practices rooted well before the 21st century. In this spirit, I will examine the Ming school of statecraft philosophy represented by the 15th century scholar, educator, and in his last years, grand secretary, Cho Jun, born in uh, 1421 uh, to 1495. Before we go there, however, I wanna start in the transition era and consider briefly how some Chinese in the Republican period 
address the problem of the state that they hope to bring into existence after the imperial system, beginning with Sun Yat-sen and then turning briefly to Hu Shi. Republican dilemmas. Sun Yat-sen was a political actor, not a political philosopher. Yet his ideas about the political constitution of the Republic that he imagined as China's future were thought out, but they were those of someone formed between imperial traditions that he knew more by popular view than by study and the tradition of Western constitutional government that he absorbed through reading and living abroad. Though he was persuaded by foreign political ideas, his discourse drew more on the language of Chinese political thought as it had to in order for him to reach a broad domestic audience. His best known formulation of the principles of Chinese Republicanism are of course, the three principles of the people, Minzu, Minshan, and Minsheng. He wrote much about these three principles without tying himself to precise definitions. The conventional translations of nationalism, democracy, and socialism are later construals and masked what he imagined when he first published this trio of concepts in 1905. What he seemed to have meant was that the Chinese people should recognize themselves as a people sharing a common ethnic identity, distinct from the Manchus, that they should be recognized as rights holders, and that they should be guaranteed the means of securing their livelihood. The future state that Sun imagined the revolution bringing into being would be lawful to the extent that it recognized and acted on these principles. All three terms sound traditional, if I may put it that way. So I went looking for them in Ming and Qing texts. No surprise, they aren't there. Minzu and Minchan, both recent Japanese neologisms are utterly absent. The idea of the people being a zhu would have had some re resonance with traditional language, most strongly with the phrase in the spring and autumn annals, describing those who are not native to the North China Plain and therefore barbarians to the Zhou state. Fei wo zhu lei, people not of our type, a notion to which I will return later. As for Min Chan, well, Chan connotes brute power. So that concept would have had no resonance whatsoever, certainly not as a means of speaking of rights. The only principle of Sun's that resonates with Confucian political philosophy is Min Sheng, as I shall shortly argue from the writings of Chu Jun. If I, from my perspective as a historian working in a different cultural framework, were to imagine a term that Sun might have used to give voice to his new political vision, but didn't, it would be one that identified the people as entitled to govern, zhi. So following his formula, min zhi, the people as rulers. The term was inadmissible in the rhetoric of Confucian statecraft. It is also missing from Sun's writings to the limited extent of my reading. By the 1920s, however, this term min zhi was in wide use among the generation after Sun Yat-sen including the liberal intellectual Hu Shi, who regarded Min Zhi as the core feature of Republican government and associated it unapologetically with democracy as practiced in the West. Through the 1920s, Hu became ever more disappointed by the failure of the political leadership of the Guomindang to advance the ideals of Republicanism and instead to retreat to the idea of single party rule. At a tense moment in his agitation for democratic culture and responsible government in 1929, he denounced the Guomindang regime for hijacking and distorting Sun Yat-sen's three principles of the people. At a time, quote, when the country is suffering very much more through and from illegal acts of government organs or acts done in the name of the government and the party, he wrote, the government, to quote again, seems to have accorded no protection or guarantee to the people against the acts of the government himself." End of quote. If the people had rights, the right to rule was not among them. Who had to tre tread gently here? But he laid the responsibility in part with Sun Yat-sen, whose unreflective political conservatism, and I'm probably the only scholar who has ever called him an unreflective political conservative, 
and excluded something like min zhi from even coming up. To translate min shan as democracy papers over the absence of the most fundamental principle of lawful democratic rule, missing from both Sun Yat-sen's model and Guomindang practice, the right of the people to participate in ruling their country. Significantly, Hu Shi did not think to build an argument from the Chinese statecraft position. He had extensive and profound knowledge of China's history and literature, but whenever he ad advocated measures to move China toward a genuine republicanism, his models were Western, largely American, who did not reach into his native tradition, either substantively or rhetorically, to chart a way forward. To the best of my knowledge, neither Hu nor Sun had read the writings of statecraft intellectuals such as Cho Jun, and therefore they have no conversation with him. Nonetheless, it is not unreasonable to suggest that the statecraft tradition may have whispered in their inner ears, even if they didn't realize they were listening. And to probe that possibility, I turn now to Cho Jun. Part three, Cho Jun. Cho was a brilliant young man from Hainan Island whose learning catapulted him from the southern extremity of the country to Beijing. And he served through the, ninth, through the 1480s as chancellor of the National Academy. When the emperor Hong, Hongzhi came to the throne in 1487. Shortly thereafter, Cho presented the 17 year old emperor with his homework. It's called Da Xue Yin Bu, Supplement to Elaborations on the Great Learning. The inelegant title acknowledges an earlier work by the 13th century Neo-Confucian Jin Xiu, who produced a program of moral education under the title Elaborations on the Great Learning. Both texts refer back to the short classical text, The Great Learning, which lays out what Cho calls a gongling, which is to say a coherent political program in eight steps. Investigate things, extend knowledge, make thoughts sincere, rectify the mind, cultivate the person, regulate the family, govern the state, and bring peace to the tianxia. And whether tianxia means world or the realm uh, depends on interpretation and on the period in which the phrase of tianxia is used. Jin De Xiu devoted 43 chapters to elaborating on the first six steps from investigating things to regulating the family. For Cho, that left the task unfinished. Two steps remained, which only the emperor could practice, governing the country and bringing peace to the realm. The emperor needed guidance, and Cho was there to supply it in all 160 chapters. The supplement is China's most systematic and comprehensive handbook of state administration. Cho compiled it during his tenure as chancellor of the academy, probably relying on the students enrolled there as his research assistants, though I'm sure he had all of the texts at his mental fingertips. To call it a compendium makes it sound too much like a grab bag rather than a programmatic vision of state administration, which it is. It's a carefully constructed unified vision of how a Confucian bureaucracy under the aegis of a morally informed but minimally interfering emperor should manage the affairs of state. The vision wasn't very much a project of its time. Cho and his generation of officials lived in the shadow of the 1449 Tu Mu incident when Emperor Zhongtong led a massive army on a pointless excursion against the Mongol great state across the Great Wall only to be taken hostage halfway back to Beijing as he beat a hasty retreat. The loss of the emperor was a constitutional crisis of epic proportions, which steady hands at the time resolved by placing the emperor's younger half-brother on the throne, an improvised solution that might have held had China not been plunged at exactly that moment into its worst seven-year climate downturn in centuries. What is unusual about the book is the voice. The text directly addresses the emperor. Chen opens his preface with the phrase, Chen Wei, your minister of verse. Each, each chapter is then structured as a sequence of quotations from the classics, each followed by commentaries from pre-Ming thinkers whose views Chen approves, 
followed then by his own commentary, which he marks as Chun An, your official comments, with Chun printed as a half-size character to display his deference to his imperial rule. Despite its enormous size and its singular uh, intended reader, the book was a hit and catapulted in, in him into the post of senior grand secretary at the remarkable age of 70. So from the supplement to elaborations of the great learning, I now want to reflect on the idea of the people as political subjects and how Cho constructs them. By political subjects, I don't mean subjects of the emperor. I mean as subjects brought into being by the political and legal system in which they were placed. The point from which to begin is the Confucian cosmology of the supplement, which rests on the theological premise shared by all monarchies that invoke the divine right of kings. Heaven appoints the emperor to rule the people in accordance with whatever principle heaven represents. In the Confucian version of divine right, as Cho puts it succinctly near the start of the fourth chapter on consolidating the foundation of the state, quote, heaven sets up the ruler to govern the people. This formulation constructs two political, even moral subjects, the ruler and the people, the one as authorized to govern, the other as authorized to be governed. But Cho does not remain passive in the face of possible divine autocracy. He follows this statement with a second, quote, the ruler must get the people, for only then will he be able to be a ruler. In case this way of putting it seems opaque, he rephrases the understanding in blunter terms. Quote, that is to say, a ruler, a ruler cannot be without people for even one day. Cho stresses the, uh, the construction of these two political subjects, ruler and people, as a reciprocal obligation producing reciprocal, reciprocal benefits. As he writes in the opening section of Consolidating the Foundation of the State, Minja, or Jiban, the people are the foundation of the state. This is a standard piety of Confucian political philosophy. Unlike other pietists, however, Cho has views on why this is so. Quote, what makes the state a state is the people and nothing else. Without the people, there is nothing by which a state can be made a state. Earlier in the same chapter, he phrases this more strongly as a reliance. Quote, the ruler lives above the people, but yet relies on the people. Why is this so? That which makes the ruler a ruler is his having the people. What can a ruler do who does not have the people to rely on to be a ruler? For Cho, the key to having the people, to getting the people, is that he should cherish the people. I mean, for example, by being sparing in the use of punishments, keeping taxes light, and being lenient when corveying labor. To do otherwise, Cho says, is, quote, to treat the people like dirt and weeds a quote I will return to later. Although charisma and discipline are elements of having the people, that task is not accomplished merely by keeping them in awe or keeping them in line. The ruler must guarantee the material conditions that will enable families to reproduce themselves generation after generation. Quote, he who truly knows that which makes him a ruler and secures his position realizes that it comes from his having the people. How can he not think about supporting the livelihood of the people, thereby achieving his own security? When the people have livelihood and security, the ruler attains what he relies on and his own position is then secure. It's in such passages as this that we see the collocation from Sun Yat-sen, Min Sheng, the people's livelihood or the people as producers, or the people as reproducing themselves. To go on in the same passage, quote, the people's livelihood, and he uses the phrase min sheng, not min sheng, but same thing. The people's livelihood invariably depends on their ruler making rules for them. So note that he doesn't say on the ruler supplying them with what they need. 
for Cho, it's that they, the ruler makes the rules by which they are able to live their lives in order to reproduce themselves. To return to the quote, by relying on teaching and leadership to a system, to assist them, the people are thereby able to gain their livelihood and nourishment. So the ruler provides conditions for the people to reproduce their existence, and the people provide the ruler with conditions that enable him to rule. It's a reciprocal reliance. When the term Min Sheng arrived in Sun Yat-sen's cultural inbox, it did not do quite the same service. Sun's idea of the people's livelihood is difficult to pin down in part because it changed. In the 1900s, land redistribution was uppermost in his mind. In the 1910s, he imagined a Republican government supporting industrial production as a means to enlarge the economy and generate income. Later, he shifted political ground. In the 1919 version of Three Principles of the People, Sun attributed the poverty of the Chinese to autocracy. What the people lacked, he declared, was not so much livelihood as the right to livelihood, which is what he believed a revolution could deliver. Early in the 1920s, Swin moved the term further in the direction of socialism, giving the state the power to control the economy and distribute its benefits. What Swin and Cho shared was the expectation that the state provide the means by which the people could live. Swin believed that, quote, our nationalist and democratic revolutions have coincided with a universal revolutionary tide carrying the world toward the people's right to livelihood. Not dissimilarly, though from rather from above than below, Cho warned the emperor, quote, those below dare not speak against those above, yet they dare to be angry. The complaints that the people have in their hearts are far more severe than what they give voice to, and the complaints that the people voice to heaven are far more severe than those that they file with the officials. So in Cho's logic, once their livelihoods evaporate, the people will find, the leader will find himself without people. The emperor's responsibility was therefore, quote, to open the road to wealth for the people. Now in the 1910s, the responsibility of a socialist government, um, as uh, Swin understood it, was to do something of the same. It seems not unreasonable to suggest therefore that the people's livelihood is a concept that Cho and Swin loosely shared. Where they differed was over the question of who should rule. In Cho's conceptual world, the ruler governs zhi, and the people sheng, they produce, they reproduce. Success in meeting the people's needs was a test of the quality, and we might even say the lawfulness of the imperial regime. For Cho, it amounts almost to a natural law argument. For if the rule, and um, <clears throat> Uh, quote, if the ruler cultivates himself and governs the people competently, the people will follow their natural inclination to goodness and will act as they know they should. Had Swin chosen to stay within Confucian statecraft terminology to imagine his political order, he might have switched out Junzhi for Minzhi, the ruler ruling, the people ruling, but he didn't. Part four, reason of state. It is easy for everyone to agree that the state has a duty to promote the welfare of the people and that the performance of this duty is a test of the lawful state. Where people and cultures differ, however, is over the political constitution and economic program we think likely is to promote popular welfare. There was a period in the history of European political philosophy in the 16th century when the appeal to the livelihood of the people as a legitimating ideology of the state set off alarm bells. In Latin, the term was salus populi, the people's health, which meant the protection not just of it, their persons, but also their property and their prosperity. What caused no little unease was when the provision of public welfare became a justification for a political regime to introduce policies favorable exclusively to its perpetuation without public consultation or even disclosure. This political logic 
associated with arguments for the supremacy of state authority, went by the term raison d'etat, reason of state. Raison d'etat crystallized as a political concept in the latter half of the 16th century during Europe's long passage from Catholic monarchy to secular republic. Coincident with, and I would argue unleashed by, Europe's expanding engagement with the world beyond Europe. Much of 16th century Europe was ruled through a small network of royals linked to each other by kinship and marriage. But confidence in that exclusionary practice was slipping and political philosophers of the Renaissance found themselves seeking to explicate the existence and legitimacy of states without taking recourse to the right of kings, whether divine or kinship derived. The depersonalization of the state generated a massive host of questions about how the operation of government in the absence of the intervening character of the monarch could be squared with the Christian morality that monarchs were accepted, expected to exemplify and uphold. Machiavelli is famously credited with initiating the conceptual problem by advising the ruler to act in ways that benefited his interests without for concern for acting in ways that embodied virtue. Among the critics of Machiavelli, who constituted the second generation of theorists of raison d'etat, was Giovanni Botero, uh, 1544 to 1617. Botero was a failed Jesuit, but a successful advisor to several cardinals. In his Della Ragione di Stato of 1589, Botero opposed illegal or immoral acts by state leaders. However, he did allow that a leader must attend to the survival of his state, an attention to which he, uh, to which he applied the term reason of state. As he defined it, reason of state is, quote, knowledge to found, conserve, and expand state dominion while upholding justice and attending to the needs of those unable to provide for themselves. I've selected Botero from among other Renaissance candidates because of his curiosity about information reaching him through the Jesuit networks about China, to which he refers several times in Della Regione di Stato. In his Relazione Universale of 1596, the English translation of which five years later found a large readership, Botero praises China as, quote, a very earthly paradise where nature and art strive to content the inhabitants, where no good thing is wanting, but much superfluous and to spare. Everywhere whatsoever is needful for clothing, for food or nourishment, delight or cause of a civil life is to be found. Botero's idea of a well-governed state did not require the Chinese example. What is intriguing though, is the extent of overlap between what he approved of and what Cho regarded as essential for the good of the state and the prosperity of the people. For example, Botero applauds the mid-Ming decision to turn away from great state adventurism, observing that quote, content breeds stability, unquote. He uses the middle Ming to exemplify a favorite argument of his against military expansionism as, quote, conquest brings care to see to the conquered, just as Cho Jun held. Otero also observes that China's borders were closed to foreigners, quote, lest their customs and conversation should breed alteration in manners or innovations in the state. Again, exactly as Cho Jun argued. To conclude, writes Botero of China, every man's endeavors tend wholly to the good and quiet of the commonwealth, by which proceedings justice, the mother of quietness, policy, the mistress of good laws, and industry, the daughter of peace, do flourish in this kingdom. There is no country, modern or ancient, governed by a better form of policy than this empire. By this government have they ruled the empire for 2,000 years. And a final quote from Botero, quote, since the country is not only large, mighty, and spacious, but united, populous, plentiful, and rich, at least let it be believed and accounted for one of the greatest empires that ever was. And here I turn to the last part of my lecture, unity. Botero wasn't 100% enthusiastic 
about the Ming example. One of the features that caught his attention was the idea that the country was not just large and populous, but united. Otero reflects on the value of unity in his reason of state, observing that political unity could lead to strength. But he also thought that political unity could work to a state's disadvantage in two ways. He notes that large states stir up jealousy and suspicion in their neighbors, which often leads their neighbors to a lie against the large state, and that it excite, excites the uh, suspicion of larger states against smaller. Secondly, quote, with size, riches increase, and with them, vices, luxury, arrogance, licentiousness, avarice, the root of all evil, so that kingdoms which frugality has led to the heights fail because of their opulence. Botero uh, combines these reasons several pages later when he observes that while a great empire may rely on its size and unity to resist invasion, quote, it is more subject to the internal causes of ruin because size leads to confidence, confidence to carelessness, and carelessness to contempt and loss of reputation and authority. Now, Botero's reasoning rests, of course, on assumptions rooted entirely in Europe's multi-state condition. From that perspective, the size, longevity, and unity of the Ming great state was eye-catching. Unity also caught Cho's attention, <clears throat> but Cho linked it to a different reason, reasoning based on China's single state condition. He accepted that the unity of the regime was the prime condition for its survival, both domestically and internationally. As I have noted in earlier work, political unification was only elevated to the status of a transcendent political principle in China in the Yuan period, when the Mongols needed a metric by which to justify their incorporation of China into the Mongol great state. Although Cho disapproved of great state expansionism, unity mattered to him, but in a different way. It was not the unity of all under heaven that was the essential condition for achieving the promise of good governance, but unity within the realm. Unity may in fact be a poor translation for his term, E1. Perhaps I should be using the term oneness or singularity or even better perhaps uniformity. At any rate, this issue of unity is the focus of chapter 78. Uh, Dao de Itong Su, unifying, uh, sorry, Yi Dao de Itong Su, unifying Dao de in order to make customs the same. There is a great difficulty in translating a Dao de, uh, Dao, the way of doing something, and de is the capacities achieved by acting in a moral fashion. To translate Dao de as morality is utterly unsatisfactory, and I'll have to keep working on this. And if anyone has a good idea for how to translate, how, how to translate Dao De, I would appreciate it. I'll use morality for the moment. Cho starts off from the ontological claim that in principle, two things are either the same as each other or different from each other. So in, his, in the Chinese, Qian Xia Zhi Shi Li You Tong You Yi. On the basis of sameness, we create categories, whereas distinction is how we separate things into categories. The task of the ruler, as Cho reminds his imperial reader in the chapter's opening citation from the Book of Changes, is to, quote, distinguish things according to their kinds and classes. This means clarifying which things, matters, or people are of the same category and which are not. On the basis of this unforgiving duality between sameness and difference, or as we might say, between unity and diversity, the ruler's task is to unify, or perhaps more exactly, to make uniform the practices and beliefs within the realm. Cho pitches this idea at the beginning of chapter 78 in abstract terms. He says, quote, things that are the same are one. Things that are different are two. Only by making what are two into one is it then possible to unify their difference and make them the same? 
So the task of the ruler here is to apply this logic to the daily lives of the people using the tool he calls Tao De, morality. And it is a tricky task. To quote Cho again, if he was above, that is the ruler, fails to mobilize morality to unify things, how can he ensure that what comes together is not careless of unity and that what is separated doesn't end up in difference? If he acts, the people will not have different hearts, families will not have different customs, and the state will not have different policies. Uh, Cho uses the metaphor of the sun, shining on everything and giving everything light in the same measure. Quote, in the same way, within the four seas and across the nine prefectures, everything is made the same and into one. And here he uses the expression tong yi, not to be the same and to be one, to be, be, but to be made the same and thus to be made into one. And to finish the quote, this is the transformation that civilization achieves. So the people's livelihood is not sufficient as a principle to secure the realm. The people also have to be made one. The language of the passage from the Book of Changes that Cho uses takes us back to Sun Yat-sen's idea of minzu. That is, that the Chinese people are a min authorized to exist in themselves as a zoo. And if I, if I may go back to the Book of Changes, quote, fei wo zu lei, those who are not of our, uh, that phrase I quoted earlier from the Spring and Autumn animals, Annals, separating the Chinese from those who are not of our category, are zu lei. In the Book of Changes, the phrase is um, uh, that you should, that the realists should use lei zu, the same terms reversed, <clears throat> in order to make the distinctions necessary for ruling the realm. So Minzu, if it has a resonance with, and I think perhaps it does have this resonance with the Book of Changes, it is in thinking of the people as one category that should be distinguished from every other possible category of people. And this is not unlike what Sun Yat-sen is proposing, that the people of China consider themselves a Zhu, a single people. And to even translate as that as ethnic identity is perhaps an over-translation, but that the Chinese people should be one people, a single nation capable of distinguishing themselves from people who are not of our type, or in the language of the Spring and Autumn Annals, people who are barbarians, whether that be Manchus or Europeans. Manchus and Europeans are E, they are different. They are the number two. That is to say, they are alternatives to the Chinese one. Chinese, by contrast, are all the same. They are Tong, and they make one people. They are Yi. Distinguishing them from those whom they aren't makes them one people. For Cho, living in the post-classical and post-Mongol reality of the 15th century, ethnic unity was assumed but not enough, where unity was found to be lacking was down at the level of daily acts and practices. And that unity had to be imposed. This was the court's duty. As Cho writes, it is essential to unify policies and teachings so that what those above do and what those below follow conform to the same heavenly principle for all and the same correct way of being human. He is commenting in this passage on rulers during the Warring States period, but the lesson for Emperor Hongzhi set out at the beginning of the chapter is the same. The realm will not be secure or stable unless you unify everything. The first task is to unify the messages the court communicates to society. Further, the task of unifying what the people think is that then falls to the educational system. Quote, when the schools teach what the schools teach must be what Emperor Hong Wu established under the regulations for schools in the 14th century. What scholars recite must be the text that Emperor Yong Le issued early in the 15th century. The ancient classics they consult should all be the editions established at that time. So Cho recognizes that early in the Ming period, the Ming ruling house um, tried to wipe the uh, the, the, the textual slate clean 
and impose through an extensive publication and text distribution system, impose a completely new set of classics that everyone should study and the old ones should be forgotten. Then Cho goes on as for the curriculum, the subjects and topics should conform to the rules of teaching and study of this single age. That is, Ming educators shouldn't go back to the spring and autumn annals. They should work only with Ming texts. And the same singularity should be promoted in every operation of government to create a single uniform realm. Quote, again, the policies of the court should be so, dao, so, de, this dao, this, this, de, this way, this way, this virtue, if you like, this morality. To continue the quote, the prohibitions and orders coming from government offices should be this moral doctrine. The careers of officials should be this moral doctrine. The lessons of the schools should be this moral doctrine. Once morality has become one, customs will naturally be the same. Those who set a moral example will not take refuge in strange antics. Those who carry out affairs will not calculate their profit and count up their merits. Those who pursue scholarship will not ride on emptiness and take wing on falseness. Those who produce literature will not tire of the constant and take pleasure in the new. And those who hold office will not form parties with their fellows and promote difference. Joe concludes, with regard to managing the realm, nothing is more important than rectifying customs. And with regard to rectifying customs, nothing is more pressing than unifying morality. Fundamental to Cho's interpretation is that absolute monarchy is the necessary condition for achieving unity in society. Unity is the key to bringing the people as a political subject to perfection, but the people on their own are incapable of creating unity. This is the work of the state and it is work that has to be done. Diversity undermines the hegemony that the state rules um, uh, and uh, a disunified populace um, uh, only further weakens the state. Diversity for an autocracy is the enemy. In simple terms, diversity demonstrates that there are other ways of doing things and other ways of speaking and other ways of thinking than those that the ruler favors or represents. To put this in more complex terms, diversity attests that there are other customs, practices, and beliefs than those of the majoritarian community, that these customs, practices, and beliefs enjoy legitimacy within their communities, and that the gap with the majoritarian morality system, to use Cho's term, will generate resistance to assimilation into the majoritarian system. This is why for Cho, the state must intervene. If it does not, the state itself is under threat. It was on this matter that Botero was uneasy about the Chinese political system as he understood it. Uh, he knew very little about Ming China, but he does make this observation. The government is tyrannical for, for throughout the kingdom, there is no other Lord but the king. They know not what an earl, a marquis, or a duke means. No fealty, no tribute or toll is paid to any man but the king. This culture of steeply structured authority, replicated downward from the emperor to local judges and officials, dismayed Botero. Quote, no man may speak unto them but upon their knees. Herein the people show their base minds, making themselves the slaves, not the subjects of the prince. Like Cho, and like Machiavelli, Botero believed that a well-governed state is one that is able to deliver the contentment and prosperity that a poorly governed state cannot. But unlike them, unlike Cho and unlike Machiavelli, Botero regarded political, the political non-enfranchisement of the people, their exclusion from deliberation and state affairs as a sign of the unlawful state. That is of a state monopolizing its powers at the expense of the people, a government in which the people are slaves, not subjects, and for which any policy in this regard may be cloaked behind raison d'etat. The only unity subjects achieve, should achieve, is their citizenship in common with each other. Slavery, by contrast, is a single category, the non-person, among whom multiplicity is meaningless and diversity of no account. In the tradition in which Botero writes, 
Um, the state that reserves its reasons to itself, that declines to reveal or revise them when subject to critique, is unlawful. Such a state may deliver benefits to its people, but when its highest purpose is its own perpetuation, which is to say the perpetuation of the leader or oligarchy controlling the levers of power, then its legitimacy is forfeit. For such a state, Botero uses the adjective tyrannical. The analogous category in Cho's language is Hun Bao Zhejun, the vicious and violent ruler, the one who treats the people like dirt or weeds, the phrase that I quoted earlier. Cho's opposite to the vicious and violent ruler is Ren Zhi Zhejun, the benevolent and I've written wise ruler, but perhaps educated would be better, the benevolent and educated ruler, who is, quote, fearful of heaven's rebuke and the people's anger. The ruler who is not fearful in this way becomes the ruler whose greatest skill ends up being ignoring the obvious, another term of chose, as a result of which, quote, above and below damage each other and calamities unspool one after the other. This, for Cho, is the tyrant, whose greed, ignorance, or cruelty divert him from carrying out the tasks that the institutions of imperial rule require. This is the famous Renger problem. They, do you find the right people to govern, or do you find the right system to govern and put the people into it? For Botero, tyranny lay with the system, not with the individual. For Cho, it was the opposite. Under an evil ruler, Morality was not unified because rights and righteous conduct are set aside, mm -hmm. policies and teachings are abandoned. During the golden age of the Kings Wen and Wu, quote, the teaching of morality did not cease. Rights and righteous conduct were vibrant in practice and politics and teaching were not abandoned. Above, the ruler had that upon which he relied to govern. In the middle, officials had a grasp of what they needed to assist in governing and below none among the people did not keep his place or dared to change. Each submitted to transformation and was unable to go against it. In this way, the millions of families were as though one family. The hundreds of states were as though one state and the thousands of ages were as though one age. Sadia Sen was vividly aware of the capacity for monarchy to be a tyranny. As he wrote in his 1919 version of the Three Principles, the Manchus, quote, imposed the rule of one man on the entire nation. They regarded the millions of the masses as their ministers and servants and indulged their whim in granting life or death in giving or seizing of all the injustices done to mankind. This has been the greatest. Consequently, in their struggle for liberty and equality, the people have had to invoke the principle of democracy. And here he goes back to Min Chan. Sun's analysis is interestingly Hegelian in its focus on the one ruler, but it also operates in an ethnic register. The so-called principle of democracy, Min Chan, was his challenge to autocracy, yet it assumed the ethnic form of Min Zhu, rescuing the one Chinese people from their common subjugation. Sun believed that overthrowing the Manchus would end the dispersal and disunion of the Chinese people. Revolution would weld that famous loose tray of, of sand into a single slab. What that might mean to those in China who did not think of themselves as Chinese and did not imagine themselves as members of a single Chinese Minzu was not an issue that caught his attention. Hu Shi was also sensitive to the negative impact that the unification of China had under an absolute monarch on freedom and originality. And he was sensitive to the seeds of tyranny that he saw in the late 1920s. But generally he pushed the problem of unity deep into the past. To my knowledge, he did not particularly reflect on the unity of the Chinese people or the Chinese nation in his own day. He spoke out in favor of quote, fixing the proper limits of government beyond which all acts become illegal but multiplicity was not an issue. Now for my brief conclusion, which I shall call Yi Yi Qi Er, making what are two into one. In the last five years, the Chinese Communist Party has seen fit to arrest dozens of Uyghur intellectuals on the grounds that they fuel ethnic conflict and threaten national unity. 
63-year-old literary scholar Geratian Osman, formerly of Xinjiang University, is currently serving a 10-year incarceration. He has been charged with, quote, excessively praising Uyghur culture and, quote, rejecting national culture. Charges that cast this concept of a national culture as a unitary entity that cannot tolerate diversity and Uyghur culture as an entity that diverges from that unity. Uyghur culture becomes the R and national culture is the E and the E is unable to tolerate the R. Uh, Osman has also been charged with inculcating separatist ideology, dividing the necessary one into the divisive two. 36 year old cell biologist, Tursunjan Normamit was disappeared last April. His employer, Tungji University in Shanghai, has since confirmed that he was taken away by the Public Security Bureau, but that agent, agency remains silent on what the charges are. None have been made against him in public. The larger rubric of this crackdown is anti-terrorism, but really it is ethnic diversity. Cho was hostile to ethnic difference, but that hostility rested on the understanding that diversity threatened autocracy and that whatever is two must be made into one. And only then is it possible for the, the autocracy to survive. This is the logic of the suppression of Uyghur identity to make what are two, the Uyghur nation and the Chinese nation into one. Those who speak on behalf of Uyghur identity must be silenced and those who live their Uyghur identity must be incarcerated by the hundreds of thousands along with Kazakhs and other Turkic Muslims in large concentration camps. The grounds for incarceration is nothing they have said, nothing they have done, nothing that constitutes in itself an illegal act. It is purely their identity as others and implicitly their refu <coughs> refusal to abandon that identity and be made into that one that is the core fe fetish of reactionary Chinese political philosophy. That the Chinese ambassador to the US, Huang Ping, should call these concentration camps vocational training centers is deeply cynical, a disgrace of diplomacy that was more than sufficient to demand that he be recalled. Allow me to conclude this lecture then with two simple observations. One, the Chinese statecraft tradition and the Renaissance tradition of the rule of law, except the lawfulness of the state is contingent upon providing for the people. Two, where they diverge is over the concept of unity. For Chinese statecraft, the imposition of unity is the necessary condition to ensure perpetual rule. For Renaissance statecraft, the imposition of unity is the point from which tyranny rises. One or two, same or different, unified or diverse. Another great divergence. And I, did, and I declined the charge of legal Orientalism for finding this to be so. Thank you, Tim. And uh, a powerful lecture that uh, uh, having read it and now hearing it again and with some um, uh, changes that you've made, uh, has got my mind spinning. While I gather my thoughts, I'm happy that I can turn now to uh, Dr. Lichenko, who has uh, uh, kindly agreed to um, offer some commentary for this part of our symposium discussion. Dr. Thank Lichenko. you very much. Um, that was fantastic, Tim and Tim. Uh, so Tim, thank you for the introduction and uh, to the other Tim, thank you for a wonderful and stimulating talk which is, I find myself, uh, I was still sort of writing notes as you were speaking. There were so many rich themes and ideas that were invoked here. So I'm just gonna issue the usual caveat that these are very much um, a, sort of my first pass at processing um, the kinds of ideas that you're putting forward here. And I hope that they will provoke discussion. Um, I And they're very much, um, just sort of uh, personal reflections on, on what you said and where it might go. Um, so in the spirit of Tim's talk, uh, let's think about the tensions between unity and difference. I suppose if my, uh, if my talk has any kind of unity, dare I say, it would be 
it would lie in this theme. Um, so one problem we might notice with recent discussions of China and the popular press and elsewhere is a false sense of unity. And by that, I mean, there's this very common conflation of China, for example, as a historical ent entity with the contemporary government of the PRC. There's a frequent conflation of the PRC with Xi Jinping. And there's, of course, the idea that China exists, it, indeed, that China exists at all as some kind of trans-historically substantial identity that never changes through time or space. I think we see all of these kinds of ideas floating around in the popular mind and in, even in um, reputable news outlets. Um, and one of the things that uh, Tim tries to do in his talk is introduce some difference into this narrative. And oddly enough, it's by suggesting a diversity of discourse on unity. So that is to say that there is a shared discourse on unity, but that there's a lot of divergent opinions within it. Um, so my comments will kind of take a riff on the tensions between unity and difference, um, starting with some very general reflections on the state of my field, which as um, Tim Cheek noted in his introduction, um, is political science and political theory. And then I reconnect at different points uh, with, with Tim's talk. So I just want to observe um, maybe one of the reasons we have trouble recognizing the, heterogene the heterogeneity of Chinese developments or of China itself um, might come most prominently from an unwillingness to seriously consider the possibility um, that Xi Jinping himself or just certain kinds of policy decisions by the PRC or certain kinds of absences or voices coming out of the, the people of the PRC um, might be coming from or rooted in some kind of plausible uh, worldview or reason. Now, this is different from saying, when I say plausible, I mean prima facie plausible. This is different from saying we would, after consideration, accept any of these arguments. But I'm reminded here of um, a widespread unwillingness in my field uh, by many people, including normative political philosophers to engage Trump supporters, for example, because they rule them out um, as simply beyond the pale, as somehow adhering to an ideology that is, is so far um, outside normative consideration that it's not even worth discussing in a scholarly manner. And I think that this is um, the kind of thing that, oddly enough, with, with regard to China is, is regularly tolerated, this idea that um, when the Chinese state does things or it takes actions that it must be coming from some kind of um, purely political and, and even autocratic exercise of power rather than in some kind of credible, plausible, defensible, arguably. I don't know if it's defensible political philosophy. Um, so this is more, I'm using this not uh, certainly to say anything about Tim's argument um, because I think Tim is, if anything, helping enrich the political imaginations that enable us to figure out uh, what actually is going on um, in the modern PRC, the contemporary PRC, but um, it is an indictment of the kind of narrow theoretical imaginations in political science. And I think these largely come from an unwillingness to theorize non-democratic forms of legitimacy. Um, and I think that Tim's talk, I, I, oddly enough, I don't know if this is his intention, but one of the things that it um, helps us do is think through some of the some of the contours of an argument that does not take democratic legitimacy as a given, and I actually think that this is a really important perspective. It doesn't it isn't it isn't important in the sense that after consideration we will accept it or find it normatively justified, but it's certainly one we have to understand if we're to understand the contemporary PRC, and I think that's part of um, Tim's point. Um, so Tim actually offers the idea in, in his talk that if legal systems differ, their differences can be subjected to an analysis that is not purely prejudicial. I mean, obviously I agree with this statement, but I wanna actually think about whether or not we can take it further as a way of contextualizing, to me, the relevance of Tim's argument um, in broader debates in political theory. Um, and in doing this, I want to invoke uh, another famous Canadian scholar named Charles Taylor. Many of you are probably know Charles Taylor from the politics of recognition, but he was actually doing incredibly nuanced work uh, starting in the 60s and 70s. Um, and he wrote uh, what to me is, a, is an incredibly perspicacious essay 
called Understanding and Ethnocentricity. I think this was in the 1960s actually, in which he tried to think about how we could render moral positions that were not our own corrigible. So this is another way of phrasing, I think Tim's question, which is how do we criticize a political system or a worldview or a set of values that are not that is not our own without at the same time collapsing into some form of Orientalism, right? Um, and Charles Taylor's response, which does later, I think, get watered down and, and diluted a little bit in the politics of recognition, is that the first thing we have to do is actually understand this alien viewpoint. Um, and Charles Taylor was very specific in saying that this understanding was not simply a matter of information gathering. It actually involved a profoundly transformative dialogue between self and other that possibly and usually entailed an expansion of our own vocabulary and self-understanding in relation to this new alternative possibility. So before we could render, say, the contemporary PRC corrigible under this condition, we then have to investigate not just the, the Chinese side of things, but we also have to, I think, interrogate and engage in some self-reflection on our own principles and categories that are driving the analysis. Um, and so one way of doing this in general, I think in political science and political theory might be to take seriously the various products of the Chinese textual tradition as advancing a plausible non-democratic political theory. And I think that this is what Tim is, is offering us here in his talk. Now, it's kind of funny because this very phrase, a plausible non-democratic political theory, in, in my field of political philosophy, it would probably be taken as inherently contradictory because I don't know that anyone would concede that there is a plausible non-democratic political theory that can be normatively justified. The default position for all justifiable political philosophy in the Anglophone Academy, so far as I can tell, is, is a democratic one. Um, but this position renders much of what has come before the 18th or 19th century, and certainly much of what is considered non-Western, um, as simply way stations on the march toward a truly democratic end of history. And, and this is a kind of an interesting parallel to Tim's um, own rightful critique of end, end of history talk as it's related to China, where this idea is that, you know, wherever China is happens to be the only place it could ever have ended up. And that this somehow demonstrates some kind of transhistorical universal principle driving this development. Um, so I think we have to recognize in this is taking this first step, we have to recognize that the same is true for our own cherished beliefs and practices, including that of democracy, um, as well as those of others. Um, so I wonder if part of the problem <clears throat> um, isn't us, all of us implicated in modern academic systems of knowledge production, um, our modes of knowledge, our disciplines, our lack of imagination that makes us completely unable to gain critical purchase on what Xi Jinping is doing other than to draw comparison to a liberal democratic state or to risk um, this, this critique of legal Orientalism that Tim um, says he is often subjected to. It's almost like we can't advance a credible exploration of Chinese political theory without seeming like we're launching a critique from a liberal democratic position because that's the only position that's available to us within contemporary political theory. So where should we begin then? Um, responding to Tim's very rich prompts, I would like to observe that. Just make a few observations here about unity and distance. And this is very much also in the spirit of Tim's uh, transcultural, uh, transnational comparison between China and Europe um, in what I would call the early modern period, the early Ming. Um, so let's observe just, just for a moment that unity is itself not unified, it is inherently diverse. But we might drill down even further and ask, what is it exactly that's being unified? We might say it's society or the polity, but that just begs further questions. What constitutes these putatively delineated or fragmented parts that require unification? Is it autonomous individual citizens? Is it groups of elites or aristocrats? Um, is it public opinion and on what questions? Um, and I actually think that Chu Jin is interesting because he, he he's really going for the throat here, right? He, he says that unity actually has to go all the way down. And I'm gonna say more about this in a moment, but I think that that's actually, that this kind of no holds barred, take no prisoners version of unity that Chu Jin is, is, is presenting here is, is actually his distinctive contribution. Um, because for many European thinkers, um, 
this unity amid difference uh, becomes a preeminent question of politics. And I think that Tim covered this in his talk, but it's only with self-consciously democratic thinkers or maybe arguably proto-democratic ones that we actually find a concern about citizens as individuals rather than as members of a group or defined by their status. So these kinds of democratic thinkers um, might ask how and where do we draw the line that would unite people meaningfully without destroying that which makes them legitimately and valuably different. And I think it's this, it's where people draw the line that distinguishes democratic from non-democratic um, ways of thinking. Now, Tim attributes this question, actually he says it's about the unity of citizenship which defines, it seems to me, defines a, a democratic or at least a liberal polity. Um, and Tim attributes this to Botero, whose work I'm not familiar with, but it strikes me that um, I wonder if Botero wasn't actually more concerned about the lack of an aristocratic layer of authority um, than he was with enfranchising like autonomous individuals to deliberate state affairs, right? Um, because this latter idea seems to be very modern. Um, and actually fairly recent. It's certainly not very Catholic, right? If he was a Jesuit, even a failed Jesuit, he would have been Catholic. Um, it's, it's after all, it's worth noting actually in, in many debates about liberal multicultural citizenship, um, the practices of Catholicism are always the ones invoked um, as an example of a submission to modern autocracy that persists in liberal democratic citizens, right? Because the Catholic church is unified in doctrine um, and, in, and in ritual practice, which is a point I will get to in a moment. Um, we might also consider someone like Rousseau, who also has a very thick idea of what, what kind of unity is required, where this poly, the polity is created precisely about what we should all universally and without exception will, whether we know it or not, right? We're gonna be unified by it and um, agreement and deliberation are really not part of it other than getting us to where we need to actually be. And it's, surprise, surprise, it's Rousseau who happens to know where it is we need to be. But in any case, in raising the allegation of tyranny about the Chinese state, Botero challenges us to answer some of these questions about unity and difference with greater specificity. So who is usurping the power that should belong to some presumably more heterogeneous entity delineated among perhaps lines of status or kinship or shared practices or even territorial residence, right? So there's lots of different ways that we can cut this unity. And then we have to ask, what is the thing doing the unifying? This is a question not only about a mechanism, right? Um, but also about principle. And this is where I'm gonna actually start talking about early Chinese thinkers, pre-chain Chinese thinkers, for the very simple matter that I teach a class on Chinese political thought this term, and we go through all of the, you know, the greatest hits of the pre-chain period. And so they're very much on my mind, but I was thinking about a lot of them as you spoke, Tim, because it seems like a lot of children's arguments have precedence in, in some of them, but in surprising ways. So um, <clears throat> what is the thing doing the unify, right? Um, this is a question about mechanism, as I said. So what is the mechanism of unification? Is it a ruler? Is it a constitution? Is it ritual cultivation? The harmony that emerges from uh, ritual moral cultivation. This would have been Confucius's response, who is oddly absent in this discussion. Um, or is it a pre reflective moral nature, in, uh, a la Mencius, for example, right? Um, but it's also a question about principle and what terms do we unite? Um, and again, actually, these, these pre chain Chinese thinkers have a variety of answers that I think are returned to time and time again in, in Chinese history. So um, to, to just uh, offer a, a very brief survey of some of those answers. Some, on what terms do we unite? Is it because the sages or our leaders tell us to, right? This is what Manchus and also Mons tell us um, is, is why, um, or is it out of a sense of security? Um, we have to protect ourselves against you know, disease and animals. Um, is it because we have an inherently human drive to group to Chun and thereby differentiate ourselves from other groups? This is Shunzi's answer, right? Or is it because we need an institution that is powerful enough and unified enough to promote popular welfare. And this seems to be children's and maybe also Sun Yat-sen's answer, right? But what I think is interesting here is that in both cases, um, Chu, Chu and Sun both seem to offer a very reductionist and instrumentalist defense of the social welfare ideal. And it has greater affinities to someone like Shangyang, a, a so-called legalist, um, who likewise reduced the people to units of economic production and social reproduction, or to someone like Mozi, 
actually. I was thinking a lot about Muadza as I was uh, hearing you talk about Trojan, um, who was, Muadza was perhaps the earliest to recognize and certainly to complain loudly about the fact that um, each person pursues their own norm in this, you know, in this pre-political state of nature. And, it, and this leads to strife and chaos until strong leaders step in to unify everything. And he would be another one who says that unity has to go all the way down. Um, but it's, it's notable that this contrasts sharply with a view more in line with the Confucian ideals. And here, I'm not just talking about Confucius and Mencius, but also maybe their um, later Song and Ming interpreters, where um, the point of, of a state that provides social welfare is not um, to uh, sort of reciprocate in some kind of power dynamic or to secure the, uh, to secure the foundations of the state, but rather it's to provide sufficient conditions for the development of of moral cultivation to ensure that, as Mencius would say, um, the moral development or the, the cultivation of the people could take place uh, without uh, anyone having to worry about conditions of deprivation that would lead to thievery and uh, other acts of, immorta of immorality, right? Um, and this moral development or cultivation of the people preoccupied not only, of course, Mencius and Confucius, but it seems they're Song and Ming interpreters, but I don't see much of this in children's uh, discussion. And I don't actually see it in Sun Yat-sen either. I mean, there's a bit in Sun Yat-sen about tutelage, right? And, and this might be what he's aiming at, right? Like we provide these conditions so that the people can eventually be tutored out of, of these conditions of subjection and become fully fledged democratic citizens. But Tim is totally right in saying, you know, Sun doesn't, his heart is not in this and he doesn't offer much uh, of, of what a democratic citizen would actually be like. He's much more focused on the, on the tutelage period, right? Um, so given these obvious alternatives from early China, as well as the relatively um, maybe more prevalent Confucian rejoinder, maybe we should not consider Chu and Sun's answer to this question is settled. So Tim's discussion centers on the diversity or the divergent opinions about this unity, i.e. Uh, so Tim at one point claims agreement on the idea that the state should promote the welfare of the people, right? But should it? So there are alternative possibilities in European and Chinese political thought. Um, John Locke would be the most obvious one here. He offers a, a picture of the state as merely an arbiter, a judge. Um, it's the people who promote their own welfare, right? We see this picked up again in Yen Fu, uh, writing in 1895 uh, about Han Yu. Um, and Han Yu says, you know, the sages basically saved everyone from starvation and being eaten by uh, enormous beastly animals. Um, and Yan Fu says, but are we to assume that the people were just waiting around getting eaten by beasts before the sages showed up? I mean, you know, they were doing something before, before the sages established these institutions and principles that supposedly saved us from ourselves, right? Um, so from this perspective and from the perspective of our present day, um, where we have a, a very different perspective on unity, I think, the unity of citizenship, um, as Tim calls it in his paper. Um, maybe we can revise the challenge that Chujin offers us. He seems to think that the unity sufficient to secure the realm went all the way down. Yi dao de, as Tim was saying, like a unification of dao de, virtue or uh, a, a virtue, un uh, understanding dao de as a kind of muscular virtue that entails a unity, not just on how, what we think and how we act, but also in what we wear and eat um, and how we act in society, right? But not everyone in Chinese history would agree with this. Um, we see these themes coming apart um, when someone like Song, the Song thinker Su Shi, in opposition to his, the institutional unification suggested by Wang Ang Shi, right? Raises the possibility that maybe everyone effectively learns about and experiences virtue differently. Like wait, what's significant actually is that Su Shi, just like Xu Jun was a value monist. I mean, he basically believed there was a singular kind of virtue out there, um, but that we would have to experience it, each of us for ourselves, right? Um, and then of course this appears again in late Yang thinkers like Li Zhi, of whom Tim Book is of course a world expert, so I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but um, they began to experiment with the idea that virtue emerged from spontaneous encounters with nature and our sociocultural environment, including our own passions, right? And that manifestations of virtue changed over time, you know, witnessed their support for writing a literature for their own times that could not imitate the ancients and, and succeed in doing what literature is supposed to do. So, and this is my final thought. Um, we might articulate the question to which Chul was supplying an answer with a bit more specificity. If unity is required for any kind of peaceful political community, 
How far down must it go? What layers of human life and experience must it unify, make similar to secure unity? This is a question of citizenship too. What must we as citizens of, an, of a modern nation state meaningfully share? A sense of justice, agreement on the limitations of power, a shared public culture. We might revise these very common questions in liberal political philosophy um, in using phrasing and a cosmology taken from children, that these are questions about the unity of virtue. They're just disagreements about how far down this unity goes. And I think it's these questions to which we might compare children's answer and by extension, Xi Jinping's as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Lee, thank you so much. That was, that was a rich commentary and, and all uh, I had hoped for and more. And uh, I had originally planned to offer a few comments myself, but I think there's so much going on in yours that I wanna throw it back to Tim, who I can see eyes are, eyes are, are brimming. Uh, and uh, um, so we'll, we'll go back and forth a little bit. Tim? Yeah, thank you. Um, Lee, that was fantastic. You, um, you understood what I was trying to do. Um, I mean, the, the paper is a little oddly written. Um, it's not written, it's not anything a political scientist would have written. It's almost not anything a historian would have written. Um, it's written out of, um, out of uh, frankly, what motivates the paper and what's motivating my, all my work at the moment is my deep, um, my deep dismay at the way in which the world is going and China's participation in pushing it in that direction. So um, um, rather, than, rather than creating as carefully structured an argument as, as I could have, I have sort of, I've just pulled together everything that is, has, is kind of crossing my mind at the moment in a way to try and uh, prevent my argument from being slotted into, oh, well, there's a history there's a, thesis, a historical thesis there, or there's a political philosophical thesis here. I want, I want, I want all kind of all the all the disciplinary doors to be open, as we try and come to terms with the with the world we're living in at the moment. Um, you've asked some great questions, like particularly what is being unified, and I have to admit, I mean. I only finished this a couple of days ago, as you know. Um, as I was reading through it today, I was finding that I'm talking about many different types of unit, territorial unification, uh, unification of custom and practice, unification of state administration. I'm talking about many different kinds of unifi unification simultaneously. And I really do need to, I think, make the distinctions. I like your question about your 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 proposal that every society expects a certain level of unity and but how far down does that go that is really i think a terrific question for um, for us to think about what we what we assume the chinese political tradition authorizes or allows what the what 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 any number of western political traditions authorize or allow um Certainly, um, and, and, and at this point in 2021, we're caught between the public performance of the virtue of diversity at a time when the world is being super unified by a handful of state leaders and a handful of international corporations. So we, it's almost as though our talk about diversity is, is a kind of happy distraction from the fact that the world is being unified very rapidly. And the powerlessness of most people uh, or the, the, the degree of capacity of most people to have an impact on what's going on in the world is decreasing rapidly. Um, I, uh, um, so uh, the, the, I mean, I, my particular focus, the way in which I come out of this issue of unity or the reason why I, it's, it's interesting, Cho's chapter on unity was something that caught me as soon as our group started reading the Dashi Yinibu. I found that in chapter 78 and I just, it just, it alarmed me right at the beginning. And it alarmed me because of the insistence over and over again through the 20th century and into the 21st century that China is one thing. We make it one thing as the observers of China from the outside, but uh, the Chinese state makes declaims it to be one thing inside. And Chinese people have become um, trained culturally to think of themselves increasingly as 
as one rather than many. Um, there was a period through this, say, 70s and 80s and 90s in which people in Hong Kong thought of themselves as Hong Kongers and people in Taiwan thought of themselves as Taiwanese and Chinese in Vancouver thought of themselves as Chinese Canadians. But the pressure has been on for the last 15 years from the People's Republic to eradicate or to erase those kinds of uh, the ideas that there are multiple Chinese identities. There's only your, your, it's in your DNA, you're stuck, buddy, you belong to us. And, um, and to, to, to practice forms of persuasion and intimidation outside the boundaries of the PRC in ways to try and increase this, which just al alarms me greatly because, um, because it, it's not, it's not, it's not the, um, it's not the world that I imagine as being of greatest benefit to most people. Um, it only benefits Chinese. And I think one of the things that's really worrying me in the last 10 years is the relative silence of Chinese on this point. Um, no one other than Xi Jinping and a few other people like that, no one, no one, is, no one is raising this issue. No one is talking about this issue. Um, uh, but, and it is not just a, a question, it's not just a Chinese question. In the United Nations, the majority of states in the General Assembly will support anything that China says. So we, we are, the world is ra running rapidly towards this unification that I think is not going to be good for us. It's not going to be good for the economy of the planet. It's not going to be good for the environment. There's every, every reason to be alarmed. I'm sorry. I'm it's speaking. not going to be good for China either. The Chinese, and, the people, and and it's not going to it's not going to be good for China because um, uh, because the people who don't agree with this vision are there and will continue to be there. Of course, the the current um, programs of genocide that have been that are being carried out uh, throughout and uh, cultural genocide um, are are all working in that direction. A few, um, uh, a few more, more specific comments. Um, I agree that Cho's arguments have deep precedence going back to the Preachin period. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about this, about his book is that he gives you his sources. He quotes from the book of changes, then he quotes from Jushi, and then he says, here's what I think. So he, he puts all his, his footnotes he gives you all his footnotes and then he tells you what it, he thinks. The book is programmatic. The book is telling the emperor, you want to run this country well, this is how you're going to do it. Um, he doesn't quote people, he, or very rarely does he quote an authority with which he disagrees. He just lines up all the people that he agrees with to make his case. And he makes it in simple terms. And it, I mean, he knows he's talking to a 17 year old who's grown up in the imperial palace. He often glosses words that uh, my classical Chinese isn't brilliant, uh, but even I know some of the terms that he has to gloss for the emperor because the emperor is not going to know what the character is. Um, so, and I think at, at the level of logic, he is, he's programmatic sometimes to a very simple point because he's desperate to get the basic po policy across to the emperor. This is what you've got to do, or in the perfect world, this is what you've got to allow me to do as your as your bureaucracy, um, and I, I quoted the, I quote the, there was a, there's a quote in which he says, "He who is above does this; those who are in the middle, the official do this, and those who are below do that." With Botero in mind, because you're absolutely right, Botero's concern was that an aristocratic authority was disappearing, and um, he's he's perhaps less concerned with with people in the street than he is with with the aristocratic families and their place in. In, a, in an order in which leadership is, is constrained in some way and the aristocracy provided, provided rulership with, as it turns out, valuable constraints in the development of, of, of Renaissance political philosophy. So th that's where his concern is. And Botera isn't quite talking about the Min in the way in which Cho is talking about the Min because for Cho, there's nothing, there's nothing standing between the emperor and the people. There is this middle layer of officials, but those middle layer of officials are all going through, through, um, through uh, thought reform in the National Academy and are going to do what Cho tells them to do. And it's going to be, it's going to be well, it's like the party. The party is not a place of reflection, although it, 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 it prides itself on being a zone of reflection, but it's not a place of reflection. They, it is there to do the rulership of the, to do what the oligarchy says to the people. So 
Um, but, and I'm gonna end my comments with, with an appreciation for what you open with in your comments. That is that we need to, um, we, we can make judgments at any point about the political systems that we're commenting on, but, but it's, it's important that we see where they're coming from and that they are plausible, that they can be plausible in their own terms. And what I didn't make as clear in this talk as I could is why Cho Jun's um, theory is plausible in his circumstances, it's very plausible in his circumstances. It doesn't translate into the Republic. In fact, the Republican intellectuals like Hu and, and Suan simply ignore the statecraft tradition. And if they paid attention, it might not have been so good um, for the emergence of a kind of Chinese republicanism. But as it is, Chinese republicanism in China was an abject failure. It's interesting to watch it on Taiwan and, and Taiwan has become one of the most interesting political experiments of the last century, um, uh, which of course is why um, China keeps flying jets over it, just to remind it that that, that experiment is gonna end at four o'clock kids and you all have to go home. So, um, we are, we are in perilous times, and I as a scholar feel that, well, this has been my role as a scholar all through my career. Can the, the degree to which we in the West understand China and the degree in, to which Chinese understand China, can progress be made? Um, um, and I feel that I'm, I'm, if I'm talking to a bit of a void in terms of Anglophone political philosophy, I think I'm also talking to a bit of a void in China. The, these ideas are not ideas that Chinese themselves learn in school or discuss or do research on. And, and I think that's too bad because, um, because China is not one thing. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Tim. They uh, already a powerful conversation going. And I'll remind folks that this is but the first uh, phase and really perhaps the prolegoma to the symposium on uh, Chinese political thought and action in changing times. And we've all figured out that changing times was a, a naughty way to imply that we are a contemporary focus, but of course it's been changing times since, you know, maybe that's the only thing that's been consistent over 5,000 years. Of, of, uh, of and, and actually, Tim, to make that point is a good one because, because as Lee says, we, we kind of monoth make China monolithic yeah. Uh, through time and space, and it's anything but. And what we're, what China is doing today isn't what it was doing a year ago. Yeah. And, and I've got a couple, and and won't be what it's doing a year from now. Uh, I'm hoping. Uh, the uh, I'm not the, the um, I do have a couple comments, and there's a couple questions uh, that we want to get to in the Q and A. Uh, but I'll be brief. But uh, but first, I wanted to note that this is the beginning of a conversation, and I'm delighted. And uh, I will not let you two go as we as we carry further uh, uh, at this. Uh, first thing to note is the dual cosmopolitanism that you both show, which is the Hu Jin Nei Wai, the uh, that you are you are treating uh, uh, um, pre-modern uh, Chinese thought and contemporary conditions as relevant and able to speak to each other. And also that you're you're talking from European Renaissance uh, uh, thinkers uh, who have an engagement, in fact, and uh, that uh, they might be relevant to this conversation that we're having about unity, diversity, and good government. Uh, and so I just I love that. And you're both um, experienced, competent, and published scholars in that field. But it's a pretty high bar for the rest of us. But I'm delighted to be a part of it. Two things for me that have struck out in this conversation today, the role of morality and the, 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 the apparent, the felt need for assimilation. And uh, the, uh, you know, I study Communist Party rectification and boy, oh boy, this is one of the reasons why when Tim and I, Tim Brooke and I were teaching together, I kept saying, this is just too familiar, you know, for my communist studies. This uh, cultivation, of course, you have Liu Xiaoqi's cultivation of the Communist Party member, and uh, this, it's not something that they didn't notice. And of course, Xi Jinping is invoking a bunch of things now, but I'm interested in the practice. And I think that's what you have both focused on. And so this, this, the, the role of morality in achieving unity for the political good. Ah, I'm just still wrestling with that. We'll let that be. On uniformity and assimilation, they, my little bit of uh, reading was 
you know, I worked on Xiangyue, the village covenants, community compacts, and of course, Wang Yang Ming's Nangan Xiangyue. There was just something in passing. It was one phrase. It was says, oh, for the Xin Min, we will do this, 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 and this. And only slowly have I realized that was an assimilation policy of the hill people in Jiangxi. He was, he was eradicating their previous culture and making them into his version of what we would now call Han, but I think he would just call civilized people. So it, the, the contemporary issues is making me reread uh, that 16th century document differently. And, and just the points that you both made, of course, is the historical roots of the current assimilation policies. Uh, uh, those of us who are doing some work on Xinjiang, you know, look at the two Hu's, uh, um, Huang Gang, Hu Lianhe, you know, and they've modeled themselves very much an American assimilation policy then in making their justifications. But I think you have clearly outlined and uh, unearthed a deeper uh, assimilationist uh, uh, theory, a line of thought in Chinese political thought. And in the end, I wanna come back to the challenge. Uh, Lee, you are uh, maintaining your well-found reputation as a uh, Neil, you know, the two, you know, just asking really awkward questions um, and uh, the, uh, which I just love. And that is, um, uh, you, you made it palpable for me you know, because my job is to try to, I've been trying to explain to people, you got to take Xi Jinping seriously. You don't have to love him. You know, I don't love him. But if we want to understand what China's doing, you got to see how does this make sense to them? And I, th I think you were saying that in a deeper way, but you got me when you said, and you, we should extend the same to Trumpites. I'm like, oh, maybe later. But, but no, you, 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 your, your point was well said. Thank you both so much. Here's some questions. Um, uh, one is uh, did Chiu Zhong's concept um, of the relationship between the people and the state draw some inspiration from the Confucian thoughts? The what is it? Xue zai, uh, zai zhou, xue zi fu zhou, right? Um, people are like water; the ships float upon it, but it can sink under it. And uh, this is from Jerry Jerry Yang uh, that <coughs> he thought that maybe um, Wei Zhong, our good old uh, Tang Chancellor, may have said that to the emperor. It, is it children reflecting any of that? Oh, very much so. Yes, okay, yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Cho, um, Cho, um, uh, actually, this is, I'm, I'm going to make a comment that sort of steps a bit outside the paper. Um, I, I nosed about to see whether Sun Yat Sen and or Hu Shur read any Ming statecraft. And as far as I can tell, they didn't. Um, who shares interest in the Ming sort of wanders into people. He, he, he reflects on Wang Yang Ming and so forth, but, and his interests go way back into the pre-Qin period. Um, but um, they, they kind of write the statecraft people out of their, mm. their vision of what the Chinese past is about. And, what, and, um, and, and Lee was very good in reminding me that a lot of what Cho is doing comes out of the pre-Qin period. Mm. Um, but what Chu was trying to do, he was trying to re, re summarize what the what the the findings of the Confucian tradition filtered down through the Song, what those have amounted to, and um, this wasn't of any interest to Chinese in the Republican period. They 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 felt if they were going to go anywhere, they'd go back to those preaching thinkers and find the kind of basic um, wellsprings of, of what Chinese culture had to offer. And so they just set aside everything that, that Cho has done. Cho is extremely well read. He's very selective. He chooses only, as I mentioned in my comments earlier, he chooses to comment only on those Confucian philosophers that, that he thought were worth quoting on and the rest he just, he just ignores. And he's always looking for an early source that is going to say what he wants to say. So he, he trolls his way through through everything up to the Hohan Shu, looking for a line that is going to say the thing that he wants to say. He's very practical minded. But um, interesting, interestingly, when he died, uh, the uh, and his tomb was built on Hainan Island, a, 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 an arch was put up, it's still there which um, celebrates him as, an, as, a, as a famous Neo-Confucian. And um, I think he would have been delighted because he, he didn't really pose as a philosopher. Um, he, was, he was a policy guy, but yet he was viewed by his own people as a Neo-Confucian philosopher. 
and he was a Neo-Confucian philosopher, but um, the sort of the creation of a kind of cleaned up recognizable history of Chinese philosophy that you could sell in philosophy departments in, in the West in the 20th century meant, meant, meant that people like him just got have gotten forgotten. So I'm sorry, this is a long-winded answer to say that, yes, he's deeply rooted in the Confucian tradition. He's an interpreter of that tradition. And if there's anything in that tradition he thinks doesn't work, he throws it out. He's not, he's not there to justify everything that's, that's, that's on the blackboard. He's only gonna, he's gonna choose what is it that's gonna work for us in the 15th century, but he does turn that into a kind of transcendent model that applies to all periods. Great. So uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I wanna be sure to get the next question in. Uh, it's from Joan Judge. Uh, uh, thanking you for an extremely stimulating presentation, but in the spirit of Lee's call for expanding imaginaries, why did Tim, Tim Brooke, did you choose Chu Jun to approach this question of unity? Are there not other Ming thinkers who would provide evidence of capaciousness in Chinese tradition? And I'll, I might call on uh, Lee to contribute to that answer as well. Um, hi, Joan. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, my, my, uh, my, my crappy answer for you is that I've been working on Chu Jun for a long time, and um, uh, Tim Cheek's been prodding me to to sort of bring out of Chojun, my reading of Chojun, what is it that I've found and, and, and how is it interesting and useful? Um, the question of unity is raised by other Ming thinkers, but I haven't done that homework yet. Um, and in a sense, what I'm doing, what, I'm, what I've done in th these last two lectures, and I hope to do a few more such lectures over the next year, is just kind of raid Chojun for what I'm finding there. And I, I, I will build up a, in the future build up a kind of more responsible kind of Ming environment for, for Cho's thoughts. But the, the reason why I wanted to focus on Cho and not go to the, to the pure philosophers, uh, if I can call them that, is that uh, Cho was a hands-on kind of guy. He was trying to figure out how do we run this country? And so whatever, whatever decisions he was making, um, have ended up mattering hugely. No student of the 16th century would think of preparing for the examination system without reading Cho Jun. In fact, Cho's influence continues on well into the Qing. Um, he was also studied in Korea and Japan. He became the, um, uh, I, 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 I don't want to dismiss him as the practical philosopher and or the pragmatic philosopher. I find, find that that almost de denigrates what he was doing. But he becomes the version of, of, of um, Chinese neo-Confucian political understanding that circulates and is the point of reference for, for everyone subsequently. So what Li Zhi may have said on the subject, while interesting, and while creating a much broader vision of what, say, the concept of unity might have meant in the Ming, um, Li Zhi was a, was a bit of a wild card and was not, you didn't quote Li Zhi on your, on your exam when you, were, when you were trying to become a Jinshu. Um, you, quoted, you quoted Cho Jun on your exam. So, um, so I guess what I'm into, I'm, um, I'll, I'll blame this on Tin Cheek again. Um, I mean, we're, what we're trying to do here is think about how Chinese thought has informed the ways in which the Chinese state exists and operates. Mm -hmm. And so I'm taking, I'm, I'm, I'm coming at the problem from that point of view. If I were to write an essay on the concept of unity in the Ming, it would have been a very different thing. But in fact, what I'm trying to do is write an essay on the, 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 the ways in which statecraft thought may have had resonances in the 20th and 21st centuries. So, um, uh, but there's more to be more to be thought about on this subject. Lee, Lee, I want to bring you in on this. You, 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 since your your new friend sure was invoked, Lee Joe is just like one of my favorite weirdos. So I have to bring that up in all of my discussions. I actually wanted to ask a question on this theme, mm -hmm. which is. Um, and it is inspired by these discussions of unity as well as Joan's question about like expanding imaginary. So I feel like now where my mind is expanding is in thinking about how unity is articulated in Chinese philosophy and how it's been 
kind of cashed out, which is why I invoke Moore as, a, as it happens, because not because I necessarily saw him as a direct influence, because Mozo is one of those weird people that kind of disappeared for a bit and people ignored him until actually until the Republican period. He was, because um, he exemplified many of the virtues of an analytic philosopher that who should loved, right? But he did, uh, he, he showed up in the Daozong in the 15th century at some point. I, I don't know if children would have, I mean, it, it's approximately around the time that children was writing, but whether or not he read him or not is, is irrelevant. I think my, my point is really to say that Moza gives us a very nice example of what you, a certain kind of unity looks like when it goes all the way down and what the consequences of it are. And like children, he does seem to advance a rather instrumentalist defense of um, not just the state, but also the individuals that comprise that state, like that they are all unified to one end, which is, I think, welfare, but in the sense of like bare life. I mean, you know. Um, I actually wanted, to, on, the, on this line of thinking, I wanted to ask um, Kim Cheek, Kim Brook, our audience, um, if anyone happens to know of a Chinese thinker from any era who could reasonably be called a value pluralist in the sense that they, they are not a, a value monist, where they don't actually believe that somewhere, sometime, there, that there is a unified Dao Zhe that, that now, of course, they all know that they disagree about what the Delta is, about what the way is, but they all seem to, even today, have a vested belief that there is a, a real true principle out there uh, awaiting realization. And then social and political life is just an instrument for realizing that. I got even one. people like Su Shi, even Su Shi, Li Zhi, that they still kind of believe that that there was a unified singular virtue out there, even if people experienced it differently. Mm -hmm. Who is it? I, I got one, Li, Li Zihou. Li Zihou, you know, who just passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and for, for, for a quick crib on him, David Ove, he's done a wonderful translation on his reading the China Dream blog of an uh, interview with Li Zihou and a, and a great introduction that dr draws from uh, Wo Lian Chong's uh, work on him. Anyway, it'd be worth a look. Tim, any thought on that one? I'm puzzling. Mm. This is Puzzle a way I've got, I've got a good. This is a question, a question that that I've never occurred to me, and it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a delightful question to ask. I'm. Uh, I would have to go to Chinese who have left China, mm -hmm. um, possibly Ying Shi. Um, huh. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'd, I'd really, and I'd have to talk to to Michael and Josephine Choduk about about mm -hmm. that. They know mm -hmm. they know Yin mm -hmm. philosophy much better than I do. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, maybe we could get uh, Josephine to to present in the series at some point, Tim. Well, on, that's right. I've, on, I've got my third step. Uh, you know, we've got Yin Shu's because Yin Shu's philosophy has been very has been quietly but really importantly influential in circles in Taiwan and Hong Kong, and I think also in China. And, and But he sort of set aside as, well, as you can set aside a, pragma, a, a, a pragmatic political actor as not a philosopher, you could set aside a historian, an academic mm -hmm. as not a political philosopher. Mm -hmm. But I think you should. But in China, historians yeah. were always the best political philosophers. They were always historians. Well, that's it's also true in the West, but nobody knows it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, we're, 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 we're humble. We, we let yeah, them know the wisdom <laughs> of, of Clio. <laughs> You know. But this this question of 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 is is there a Chinese thinker who is not a, a monist? That's a mm. that's a big challenge. I'm going to let us I actually get it from Gloria Davies. Actually, yeah. Gloria yeah. Davies, who's, who's sort of in her book worrying about China, she basically says you have to accept that academic discourse in China is ultimately about it. it everybody is is assuming that there is a, a real yeah. truth capable of being realized out there, a singular truth. Yeah, we might all disagree about what it is, but that means that you're you're yeah. moral, right? And this is exactly what they're arguing about. Whereas the idea yeah. of legitimate disagreement is not, it's just not a foundational assumption. And I think we have to think about that when we consider something like Xi Jinping, uh, these, these discourses of unity, right? There's another problematic person we can invite in, the, uh, Gloria Davies. So the Davies question, I, I'm going to cut in because, I, uh, they, but I've written it down, uh, Gloria. Um, the, uh, because there's one more question from Calvin Lin that I think is really good and follows through on our um, question of um, of um, 
how far down does unity go? But a first a note that I forgot to mention from from um, uh, um, uh, Allison, uh, excuse me, th from uh, um, uh, Joan Judge, uh, she noted that Charles Taylor was a Catholic. So they're just just uh, to yes, he's famously views. Catholic and there a communitarian, is. which is where yeah. his you know yeah. No, no, it's it's good stuff. The um, so from Calvin, uh, he had the question of. Um, that he's worried it'll be too broad or too narrow, but I think it's a great question. How close do Ming provincial or county administrations follow children's ideas of unity? Could this question perhaps help us answer the concern of how far down does unity have to reach? So this actually is the implementation. Yes, um, Calvin, I'm delighted with the question. Um, I think I think there there's your PhD topic for you. Um, <laughs> it, it would be uh, the the reason and why I think it's interesting is that um, as I as I mentioned uh, sort of a toss off in my remark, uh, Hong Wu and Yong Le made sure that texts got into county level school libraries. Um, they distributed them throughout the realm. Um, the one Mid Ming text that there is an effort is made to get into county level libraries is the Dashui and Ibu. So most, uh, most functioning school libraries in the second half of the Ming had a copy of this in their library. Mm -hmm. And it would probably be that, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this would be a text that was available to students and therefore, at the, among students studying for the exams, this would be a text that they could refer to because there were physical copies available to them. How this translated into state administration? You okay? Um, yeah, I've 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 lost I've lost the zoom on my laptop. Doesn't matter as long as am I still there? For yeah, you? we still see you. You're still, you okay? Okay. Your, on, your just... ontological essence is still with us. Okay, um, the, um, how that affected state administration would be really interesting. I can't offhand think of an example of uh, that I could say, oh, there's, there's the influence of Cho Jun on what a local magistrate is doing. Um, but, um, uh, but I think many of Cho's ideas would have, would have uh, would have resonated at the local level. That, that would be, um, that's something I haven't even thought about. I'd be fascinated to know more. That's great. I'm going to wind us up because I promised we'd be done uh, by the two hour bell, because this is a conversation that will continue. But I want to close. Alison Bailey had a wonderful um, a comment to add, uh, which is that um, in response to, to uh, uh, Lee's comment, um, ritual was central to Jujun's political thought. And I think Alison has been reading with you, Tim, as I recall. Yeah. Um, music brings things into accord, Tong, while ritual creates differentiation, E. So both are needed. So ritual and music might have that dance of unity and diversity, and, and, and it's clearly relevant in his thought. And the, uh, in the end, she's got a question which we won't be able to chase tonight. Where is Kang Youwei's da, da, da Tong Shu uh, fit into the Republican uh, genealogy of concepts of unity? Stay tuned for that answer in our next session. Thank you, Timothy Brook. Thank you, Lijenko, for uh, starting us off this fabulously. This was and great. All, thank you. Thank you all. And uh, uh, off to a good lunch, a good dinner, or uh, uh, to bed. <laughs> a good night's sleep. Very yeah. good. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Uh,